today is um, or yesterday it was the greatest day in the quantum foundations during um, the last maybe 20 30 years yeah so the nobel prize was given to alan aspect uh, uh, to Klauser and um, Zeilinger, to Zeilinger. Uh, this was a Nobel Prize uh, for quantum foundations, and this is great distinguishing feature of this Nobel Prize, of this Nobel Prize, because before all Nobel Prizes during in physics during last years were more or less for applied things. Even um, the prize um, which was a few, maybe. Five, no, a few years ago, which was declared as the prize for quantum foundations, was in fact for atom clocks. Atom clocks, and it was more or less prize for good optics. For good optics, yes. And now it is really the prize for uh, which was given to people, experimenters, but they did great experiments who really uh, went very deeply, very deeply in um, the mysteries of our nature and they uh, they don't, my personal impression, my personal impression is that they did not clarify the issue, the issue of how, um, how, how on, on the structure of the micro world, but at least they gave us experimental data, which uh, experimental results, which we can now interpret and, and be sure, because before they experiments, before they closed all loopholes, of course, you always was on shaky ground. You was not sure that um, you really can, um, can use this approach. What is the great also in these days? Because um, uh, I uh, put 22 years of my life in quantum foundations and conferences in my town Vexho in Sweden. And um, two of um, Nobel Prize laureates, uh, Alan Aspect and Antoine Zeilinger, have been few times in Vexho and they gave the great talks here. And um, what is also was um, a bit coincidence at few conferences, I invited the members of Swedish Nobel Prize committee, so there was some uh, some my personal contribution to this um, to this, and um, also in Vexho was the session at the conference Beyond Quantum 2016, where all groups which did at this time experiments, uh, which did at this time experiments um, on violation of bell inequality, and we shall speak about bell inequality. They gave the talks in Vexho. So and um, beyond my um, beyond my um, video in uh, comment, I shall put links to these talks. So one can just not just follow my blah blah blah, which is uh, devoted to usual simple, so to say, simple people, but also go to the talks of these great people of these great people. Uh, uh, so what is, uh, now in few words now in few words. Um, what is about these experiments which were done and what is the problems which were in the discussions, in the debate. Uh, in, in fact, this uh, My Town Vexho was the center of these debates and they still continue and they still continue. And I'm even not sure that these people who got Nobel Prize, they have the same interpretation of their results, at least at least I have um, heard from them very different opinions how to interpret the violation of Bell inequality. So, what is the issue of this problem? Uh, at the very beginning of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr, he and Heisenberg, they proceed in this way, that um, they, um, they were sure that quantum mechanics is not about what happened in the micro world, but this is just the theory of our measurements over micro systems. So the stories which we which tell us quantum mechanics is not about electron as it is when nobody look at it, but um, this is the story about interaction of electron with our measurement devices. So this, in some sense, this is was rejection of realism of the properties of quantum systems. 
So the results of our measurements, outcomes of our measurements, they cannot be associated with quantum systems. So uh, electron, in fact, um, beside of a few special states, eigenstates of um, quantum observables, they don't have objective properties. So, for example, we cannot tell that electron is located in this place. No, electron is um, located somewhere or or maybe even electron does not have uh, such notion as location at all as, um, as um, electron by itself. Only when we start to measure its location, our measurement device tells us where it is. The first um, ideas about this were Heisenberg, this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and he pointed out that for quantum system, it, is, um, it seems, it's again the even Heisenberg uncertainty principle has different interpretations. Um, uh, so it seems that we cannot determine at the same time location of, for example, electron and its uh, velocity, its momentum. And um, his reasoning was um, developed on um, interaction of um, photon, which measure position of electron with electron and its disturbing property. Um, oh, many people, the majority of people, of course, accepted this reasoning of Heisenberg, but later um, Heisenberg principle was also criticized a lot, and especially by such people as Ballantyne and Marginal. Ballantyne and Marginal. Um, those who are interested can read their papers. So, it, this was position of Bohr. Einstein, he was realist. He was sure that quantum systems has objective property, that electron has position and electron uh, has momentum, it um, has its velocity, and just quantum theory is so bad, it's so um, approximate theory that we cannot um, that we cannot describe these properties, these properties, objective properties of quantum systems, and of course all his life. Einstein has the dream for a creation of new theory, of new theory which would be theory of um, objective properties, um, uh, properties of electron as it is and uh, photon as it is and so on. And um, Bohr disagrees with him, so if you follow Einstein, we can tell, oh, look, now our measurement devices are so bad that we cannot go deeper than, for example, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But um, uh, then we shall get better devices and we shall go deeper and we shall get something more. From Bohr position, our measurement devices may be not the highest technology advanced, but um, already these devices show at us that we cannot go deeper, we cannot go deeper. Um, there are no objective reality at least in these terms that we use, that we use in these terms, uh, these such notions as position, momentum, energy, these are our macro, microscopic, macro, macro, uh, macroscopic notions, and they have um, not so much to do with the life of electron or photon. Of course, they are related, because by Bohr, what we get until this is energy of electron, this is result of very complex interaction of electron and our measurement device for energy. Um, Einstein, jointly with um, two co-authors, Podolsky and Rosen, so many people told that in fact it was idea of Rosen, and Einstein by himself was not totally sure in this idea, presented some argument at this lecture, I cannot go deeply in this argument, that um, electrons and other microsystems, they have objective properties. They have objective properties. But the argument was presented in such philosophic terms, and some of them very ambiguous as elements of reality and so on, that they presented the argument in the beginning of 30s, and until 60s, the middle of 60s, this argument was more or less the topic for philosophers. They discuss um, um, is quantum theory about objective reality or not, and so on. Uh, some people told that Bohr was idealist. It is wrong. 
Of course, Bohr's recognized reality of atoms, electrons, and other quantum systems, but he did not recognize that what we call energy of electron, position of electron, and uh, velocity of electron, that they are properties they. They are not our results of measurements. Why it was surprising that, for example, the position of Bohr? Because in classical physics, we can always determine um, uh, jointly the properties. For example, if you drive a car and you see the sign that uh, there is 80 kilometers to London, at the same time you can look to the uh, and to speedometer, sp speedometer and see the velocity of your car. So you know both position and momentum. If you know mass of the car, you know also momentum. So the situation when you can easily look and see that it's 80 kilometers to London or look and see what is your velocity, it seems to be strange. It seems to be strange. But on the other hand, it seems that even in this so classical situation, we can find context when it would be impossible to look to how, how, how many kilometers is still to London and to see what is your velocity. But okay. So, this is in human life. In human life, it seems that this um, property of which was called by Bohr complementarity or existence of incompatible observables, it seems that in human life, it is more natural that um, they exist in compatible observables and so on. And this is um, a part of what now people use uh, applications of quantum theory outside of physics. This is quantum-like decision-making and quantum-like cognition, where I also did a lot, where I personally also did a lot. Okay, so these ideas of Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen were considered as blah, blah. Uh, Bohr, with his um, uh, struggle against objectivity, also was considered more or less as philosopher. Many people in the 60s would not even um, except that he has uh, contributed to really quantum mechanics, big size of Bohr atom, Bohr atom, and so on. And then on the scene appeared John Bell. It was the, one of the greatest events in quantum foundations. As very often, people who do great discoveries, they are not experts in the field, and they don't have the job in this field. So this is great because um, the later, the later is very important. People should not follow the mainstream, uh, the mainstream of this um, area of research. They need not publish papers in this area because if you, you could not publish paper which is really out of the stream, yeah, it would be very difficult or nobody will see this. Nobody will see this. And the second, people should not be so obliged to follow this stream because they have good job and um, John Bell worked in CERN and he did experiments more or less as people did recently with CERN to find Higgs boson and so on. And John Bell was able to transfer these um, ideas of um, ideas of Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen into experimental framework. And this is great because um, experimentalists um, um, it, he gave job for hundreds or maybe thousands of experimentalists. And more or less, this is was one of the first steps to quantum information theory, these experiments which were done. And what was, uh, what, was um, what, what is the experiment which was considered by, uh, by Bell? I shall present it in the modern framework, yeah, in the modern framework. So this atom and laser, we push pulse from laser uh, and some atoms um, is, is, is crystal, this crystal and um, we send uh, laser pulse to crystal and some atoms of this crystal emit pairs of photons and in some sense these are um, twillings, these are um, twins, they are twins and they go in different directions to two laps, theoretically to very long distance one from another and then in these laps people start to make uh, measurements of polarizations of photons. But it is impossible to make measurement of polarization vector. 
we can measure only pro, uh, so the classical picture that photon has some vector, which is um, uh, classical picture, which is totally wrong. There is a ball, photon moving in space. It has some vector, which is this polarization. And then in the lab, we have some measurement device, polarization beam splitter. And uh, this is also orientated in another direction. And when photon with its vector, uh, with its polarization arrive here, we measure projection of photon's polarization to this axis of polarization prism or polarization beam splitter. And um, um, we can measure to another axis, we can rotate polarization beam splitter and uh, get projection to another axis. But we never can make these projections jointly because even quantum formalism told us, uh, even quantum formalism told us that um, uh, there is no polarization vector. There are only projections because projections are incompatible observables. So um, we cannot measure in some sense all coordinates of this polarization vector. We can measure either its projection to one axis or to another axis. And these projections are incompatible observables. But Bell tell, nevertheless, suppose that this is not problem of reality, of physics, but this is just the problem of quantum formalism. That these observables are incompatible, but uh, you, um, you have very bad measurement device, the uh, polarization beam splitter, some um, prism, some crystal, uh, but maybe in future your children will find something better and they would be able to measure really polarization vector or oh, its projections at the same time, all three projections at the same time, and maybe your children will see a totally different world. Of course, Niels Bohr would tell, no, quantum mechanic is about reality as it is. Your children, grandchildren, grand, 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 grandchildren will use the same theory and you will never get such new measurement devices, which will get you such results. Okay, okay. So, suppose we measure projection of um, polarization vector to some axis. And if they um, go, if, if the angle between them is less than 90 degrees, uh, we put plus one for this projection. If this um, projection is going in the opposite direction, we put minus one. So, for fixed orientation of polarization beam splitter for prism, we can get at this side either plus one or minus one, depending on orientation of what we suppose exists, the polarization vector of the polarization vector of photon. We do the same in another laboratory, which may be on 100 kilometers from the first. And here we can select another orientation of um, this prism. So here prism is under this angle fixed, and we measure projections um, of this polarization vector. Vector maybe not exist, but there is measurement procedure, how to get projection. We, we measure projection, yeah? Here we have another orientation on the different angle, and we also measure projection, and we also can get either plus one or minus one. Then we cal calculate correlations. How we calculate correlations? We take here plus one, for example, and here is minus one. We multiply them, we get minus one. If there are two pluses, we multiply, we get plus. If there are two minuses, we multiply, we get uh, plus. And if there is minus here plus, we again get minus. Then we calculate the sum, divide to the number of photon pairs which we send to these laboratories, and we get uh, correlations. It's not enough, it's only the beginning of the story. Then we change in this laboratory the orientation of polarization beam splitter. Now it's oriented in the, the different direction. And in this laboratory it's the same as before. And we calculated correlation for these two orientations. Then we use this, but here we change. So we, we, have, um, we have four experiments. So there are two pairs of uh, possible orientations in this lab and two possible orientations of beam splitter in this lab. And we uh, combine them in pairs. We combine them in pairs. What is the main problem, as I told, that we cannot measure both projections of photon for this direction which we selected for one experiment and for this direction, which we selected for another experiment. But we can collect these correlations. After this, we take the sum 
three correlations are with plus and one is minus. And then it was great contribution why Clauser. Uh, it's great unfortunate that John Bell died. John Bell died. Hmm. And Shimoni died. Shimoni died. Um, I was a um, few times in Boston and I was at his seminars and it was very deep. Um, Shimoni was philosopher, but his contribution to this business um, uh, is also great. Was is also great. Philosophers can do great for physics, yeah. And this is Shimoni, uh, the biggest example of such contribution of a philosopher to physics. Yeah. So Clauser, C H S Clauser. Uh, Horne, Shimoni, Holt, CHSH inequality, they proved this inequality, is different from original Bell inequality. For original Bell inequality, have not, the experiments have not been done, and it's very interesting to do such experiments on archive. You can find my papers with um, where I discuss possibility how practically realizable experiments with original Bell inequality and um, they prove this inequality that this sum of correlations and it's very important that these correlations were collected not in one experiment but in four different experiments they should be less or equal than two and when who did the first experiment the first experiment was done by alan aspect very young boy in paris in paris who did this experiment it was really brave young boy da? Because at this time nobody was interested in foundations. When um, Alan Aspect uh, defended his PhD, members of PhD jury they told, "Look, you did so good uh, technical job and you are good experimenter, but it's so strange activity. It seems that you would not find any job with such PhD." So he did this experiment. Um, uh, he has the source of photons. Uh, these photons um, called it entangled, that they have the um, um, the properties which are correlated, which are correlated, and they are correlated even for incompatible observables. Here is the main point. Not just that they are correlated. Even classical systems can be correlated, but they exist in compatible axes. And photons, um, photons polarizations, projections are correlated for incompatible axes. And then it was done this experiment with measurements and, um, and he proved the violation of CHSH inequality. Uh, what was the main problem? That it was very, these uh, devices all were very closed on one table. And there was so-called um, non-locality um, loophole that if you change here the orientation, then its um, output would propagate would propagate and go to another side, go to another side of this table and disturb measurement. And therefore, it is not usual correlations, but non-local correlations. Then it was great step by Gregor Weiss. No, Gregor Weiss also was many, many times in workshop at these conferences, maybe 10, maybe more. And he did this first great experiment when this non-locality loophole was closed. So he put um, the optical fiber um, uh, under um, the lake. I think it was in Innsbruck, in Innsbruck. No, I was in Innsbruck with him, but okay. I think it was in Innsbruck. And he, uh, now the signal from one side of lake, was, when he changed orientation, it was not able to go to another side of the lake and disturb measurement and make correlations non-local. Because these correlations which um, satisfy CHSH inequality, they are local correlations. So if, if we assume that a measurement here uh, for the projection for this axis in this lab depends how is oriented um, axis of uh, polarization beam splitter in another lab, you cannot prove CHSH inequality. So this was one of the greatest steps towards this final resolution of this Bell experiment. And then there were done many experiments, there were done many experiments, and um, um, one of the problems was that detectors were not so good, detectors were not so good, uh, um, and um, they lose a lot of photons, 
So statistics was um, in, in some way it was a kind of post selection. And by playing with this, that you can lose many, many photons, many, many photons. Then it's um, um, you can also violate CHSH inequality without problem. So without um, any action on the distance. So I, I in some way I was too quick. So when um, uh, aspect um, so um, that um, this inequality is violated. What is resolution, possible resolution? Let us try to speak about interpretation. One resolution is up in the framework of um, Niels Bohr that there is no there is no realism, that there is no objective properties of quantum systems. Punct. The end of the story. So from this you point, and this is my position, you can read my paper on archive, get rid of non-locality from quantum physics. Uh, this is, um, there is no need in non-locality. So if you're on board position, this um, bell type experiment, which was done by aspect um, and this um, for this new CHSH inequality uh, done by other people, it does not um, tell us anything more than position of Niels Bohr, than position of Niels Bohr. But um, suppose you cannot live without reality. And majority of physicists, they cannot live without realism. Because otherwise, what you are measure? When I tell, we measure projection of polarization to this axis and to this axis. But if there is no polarization, so projection of what? If this electron has no energy, has no position, has no momentum by itself, but all this is produced by our measurement devices, then up to some, uh, you can't think that people in the experimental laboratories, they, they just play with the experimental devices. Of course, it's not the case. Even Bohr would not agree with this because they play with interaction of micro and macro systems. Micro are electrons and photons and macro systems are measurement devices. Therefore, physicists want realism. John Bell was realist. He wanted real, real world. But he was surprised because how he explained if there is realism, if this, um, if this um, polarization of photons really exists, then this CHSH inequality should hold true. So it should be boundary too. But Alan Aspect violated it. And uh, quantum theory predict violation of this inequality. Another, another possibility was that they can happen similar to what happened, um, can, could happen. And in fact, it happened in Alan Aspect experiment. Because your, his data was what people call direct signaling. Really, this um, change of this axis really changed statistics on the other hand. Not so many people know this, but you can read my recent paper in Entropy Journal about signaling, about signaling in these experiments. Jo um, aspects, uh, statistical data uh, suffered of very, very heavy signaling. So it seems that, si that such signaling exists even on distance of million kilometers. And it's this signaling goes quicker than um, uh, velocity of light. So, and this was what Einstein called spooky action at the distance. That this is something terrible which happened in physics. Which, because before, before Einstein has very nice picture of signals propagating with velocity of light and everything is good. And here one electron on uh, Earth field. What happened with another entangled with him electron on in, all, in another star system and Sirius or um, Alpha Alpha oh, no at some at some different star at some different star. Um, this was spooky action at the distance and in fact you had choice either just uh, I follow Niels Bohr Einstein was with his realism was really old fashioned guide I can forget about him. Um, then you need not any spooky action at the distance and um, you can see the Bell experiments is just confirmation of Bohr principle of complementarity. I, I again repeat that this is my position. 
Or you can tell, oh, I'm so afraid to that quant microsystems do have don't have objective properties that I should accept that they have objective properties, but then um, I have the spooky actions at the distance. And majority of people in quantum community, at least in quantum information community, they expect uh, accepted this existence of spooky actions at the distance. Of course, they don't tell, they don't tell this um, honestly, and for this, they, um, some opportunistic position, majority selected opportunistic position. Opportunistic position is what they call local realism. They don't tell that uh, violation of bail inequality tell us either uh, that we should select that either uh, we follow board position, or we reject board position and then we follow the spooky actions at the distance. They told no violation of bail inequality just demonstrated that local realism, that reality, that reality cannot be cannot be local. Reality cannot be local. Da? That local more or less yeah, that, that violation of bell and other bell type inequalities tell us that it is impossible to assign objective properties to quantum systems in local way. If we even assign to them uh, objective properties, they would be non-local. Of course, non-local objective properties, they look very strange. Here I started to cite, maybe in this, uh, it will be the second part of this talk because I am far from finished. Um, really details how it was done and um, what is the opinion of people who were involved. Here I started to um, to refer to some my conversation with some famous people, some famous people. But um, of course, all these conversations they were um, very often there was wine, there was uh, dinner and so on. Therefore, I could not say honestly that they to, um, say precisely this. Therefore, before each this discussion about private opinions of famous people, I would tell that it seems, at least, or at least my impression is that this guy has uh, this um, uh, had this in mind or wanted to say this, but maybe I totally wrong. Uh, one of what I like very much, in fact, I did not like position of Nicholas Gizan because this is position of this non-local, non-local, non-local universe, non-local universe, uh, and he drive this position very strongly, but at least he's honest in his position. He's not opportunist. He don't, and if I remember correctly, at one of conferences, it was not in Vexha, it was somewhere in, even suspect in Czech Republic or somewhere, um, he told me, he told me, uh, look, what is local realism? Can realism be non-local? So you should you should um, you should not you should stop to play with this ambiguous notion as local realism. And this is also one of the messages of this video that majority of physicists are in opportunistic position. They think, oh, this is great experiment, local realism is rejected. But what is um, opposite? Either you have this um, action of the distance or you should reject, um, you should reject realism. And um, um, yeah, so at this point I stop. And maybe next time in my next lecture I will speak more, um, more about, um, about opinions of um, other people, including two. Nobel Prize winners, uh, Alan Aspe and uh, um, Anton Seilinger, and um, yeah, and, and, and Anton Seilinger. I also spoke with Klauser at, uh, in Vienna, maybe it was conference 50 years of um, uh, Bell inequality, but I fortunately I forgot, I forgot this discussion. Uh, what was the uh, position of Clauser? I don't remember because it was permanently interrupted by um, David Merriman, who pointed so much attention on this free will, and this free will issue disturbed our um, real physical discussion. Okay, so this is the end of the first my reflection. 
to this greatest um, event in quantum foundations. I hope that after this Nobel Prize assignment to this People, um, the interest to foundation will give uh, give rise, so people will stop to do this quantum computing exercises of linear algebra and Hilbert spaces and so on, and they will start to think again about quantum foundations. All the best and.